Now, years ago, uh, a very fine historian, George Fredrickson, wrote an interesting book along these lines about other intellectual consequences of the Civil War, particularly for the sort of reformers, the abolitionists, other kinds of reform movements uh, that had existed before the war. And he made an interesting point that before the Civil War, with the federal government under the control of what they called the slave power, northern reformers and others were alienated from the government. They, they, most reform took place outside the realm of the national government. It was moral suasion or other things. It didn't require using national power to change society. Um, the war is a turning point in intellectual life in this sense. That is, it, instead of the reformer standing outside the institutions as a critic, like the abolitionists, that's their role, to stand outside the institutions and voice, you know, put forward an alternative vision. Now they wholeheartedly commit themselves to the war effort. The abolitionists do this, even though most of them were pacifists before the Civil War. A few pacifist abolitionists refused to support the war, but that's very, very few. They now, a kind of institutional identity replaces this separation. It's the exact opposite of what happens in World War I. World War I, where many of the intellectuals you know, joined up in this crusade to make the world safe for democracy, but the end of the war was such a disaster in terms of democracy uh, that, that it led to a complete alienation, the so-called lost generation of the 1920s as a reaction against what they saw as the meaninglessness of World War I. But in the Civil War, it's the opposite. Now these people who are standing outside identify wholly with the government. And in the post-war decades, reformers look to the government to change society. That's the way you do it, through laws, through actions, uh, not through moral suasion, not through local action. Obviously, emancipation is the model of this. Emancipation, the greatest social change, of the 19th century comes through an unprecedented exercise of national power, right? It's an example of what national power can do if it is guided by morality, guided by, you know, progress, um, etc. cetera. Um, individual, but the, the other side of that is it makes in the individual critic now suspect um, and Reformers who had stood outside defending the rights of the lone individual against the society now join up in the demand for patriotism, the demand for loyalty. All wars produce demands for, you know, support for the war and lead to at least have a tendency towards stigmatizing those who criticize the war, not only as people with a different point of view, but as traitors, as a fifth column, as people undermining the war effort, and even people like, who, like these abolitionists who had been complete outsiders and defending the right of dissent now go along with the suspension of habeas corpus and, and things like that, which we'll, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, one example of this, which uh, many historians have written about, is the, what they call the U.S. Sanitary Commission. The U.S. Sanitary Commission, which was a, an effort to, a big organized philanthropy to uh, raise money for, to help alleviate the suffering of soldiers, send supplies to soldiers, wounded soldiers, help the widows of soldiers. The Sanitary Commission raises private money all around the country to assist in this way in the war effort. But it is now, and, and it mobilizes large numbers of women. This is how northern women, particularly middle class women, can join up in the war effort not by taking to the field, obviously, but by organizing what they call these sanitary fairs. Uh, some women did go and work as nurses um, uh, and, and other ways directly with soldiers, but many more worked through these sanitary fairs to raise, uh, to raise money. They, and uh, here's a, a kind of, where, let's see what this is. Oh, here's a cute, this is one of the things sold at the Chicago Sanitary Fair, a potholder, see? Any holder but a slave. This was knitted or crocheted or whatever by a woman and sold uh, at the Chicago uh, Sanitary Fair. The effort, the war, as in 
we will see more about this as we go along, but as in the South, the war obviously creates new or opens new roles for Northern women with millions of men pulled off into the army, jobs open for women that had been closed to them, other kinds of opportunities open for women, the opportunity even to work in these reform organizations. But they're very, the, my point about the sanitary affairs is they're very, very controlled from the top down. They're a new kind of reform organization, not locally based, not very kind of almost anarchistic the way many of them operated, but it's very controlled from the top down uh, by men. Even though women are doing most of the sort of ground level work, the top, uh, the top uh, uh, authority is always men. But, um, but nonetheless, the, in the Civil War, the suffrage, the women's suffrage movement from before the war basically suspends operations and devotes itself to the struggle for emancipation. Women like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Stanton, we'll talk about them in a bit uh, down the road, but they, the movement for women's suffrage suspends that issue in order to support the war effort and support the struggle for emancipation, black soldiers, etc. But the very, the very public effort to do that and the very experience of independent work helps to seed the post-war women's suffrage movement. That at the leaders of the post-war women's suffrage movement, many of them come out of these sanitary fairs or other civil war activities. However, however, I must emphasize, that's a minority. Just as Drew Faust, I mentioned, wrote Mothers of Invention in which he argued that Southern upper class women did not want the new authority that was thrust upon them. Similarly, Nina Silber, a scholar of Northern women, Daughters of the Union, a very fine book, again argues somewhat against the idea that there is just a direct line between working for the war effort and the women's movement after the war. That most women, she argues, want to go back to their old roles. These, these domestic roles are so deeply ingrained in 19th century uh, culture that it's a minority who think about moving beyond, even though they say, well, we need more education, but the notion that you can actually challenge the idea of a woman's place being in the home is a very, very uh, radical and difficult thing to do. In other words, it's not like World War II, which you, you, know, you remember produced Rosie the Riveter and millions of other women working in factories, working in men's jobs, pre pre previously men's jobs, who do not want to go back to the home, after, have to be sort of pushed back into the suburban home and want to stay in paid employment after the war. After the Civil War, it's, not, it's, it's more complicated than that. But anyway, um, as I say, my main point is that reformers become used to relying on the government to achieve their ends. But even there, there's a kind of uh, tension in this uh, abolitionist group. And I, I'm using abolitionists to include radical Republicans. Uh, this centralization doesn't completely erase the older, more individualistic approach. And you can see that in the debate within the abolitionist movement about whether to disband at the end of the war. We're now slightly jumping ahead uh, a year or so. But in 1865, the war has ended. Slavery is basically dead. Um, the American Anti-Slavery Society has this internal debate about whether they should continue in existence or not. William Lloyd Garrison, who by this point had become just a Republican Party operative and had been strongly supporting Lincoln's reelection in 1864, a guy who said you can't vote before the war was now drumming up support for the Republican Party. Garrison said, we have finished our job. The job of the abolitionist is over. Slavery is ended. Therefore, he said, my vocation as an abolitionist is ended. He suspends or ends, that is, the publication of The Liberator, The Liberator, the weekly abolitionist newspaper, which had begun publication in 1831, now ends in 1865. And he, at, and he calls on the American Anti-Slavery Society to dissolve. But at that meeting, Frederick Douglass and Wendell Phillips argue, no, we can, our job is not done. Our job is not done. More is needed. 
in a way, we're getting a preview of Reconstruction here. Is, has freedom come now and therefore blacks should be left to their own devices? In other words, they will compete in the marketplace, they will rise or fall on their own merit, there's nothing more to be done for them? Or is there still need for federal protection, federal intervention? Douglas and Phillips say the black man is not free, and it's the man of course, until he has the right to vote. Without the right to vote, slavery is not ended. A few of them, and we're jumping ahead here, say even more than that is necessary. Land. They need an economic foundation for their freedom. And the American Anti-Slavery Society decides not to, not to dissolve. They override Garrison and they continue, until, they continue in existence fighting for black suffrage. They dissolve in 1870 when the 15th Amendment is ratified granting black men the right to vote. But even then they dissolve and the land issue has never been solved. But so in other words, there's this debate about how much federal action is necessary to actually preserve the freedom which people have acquired uh, in the Civil War. Where, as I say, this is looking ahead a little bit, but it's, it's debated in the Civil War. So along with this focus on the government, there is this other strand, still very strong, that once people are free, once free labor comes into existence, then it's a kind of a laissez-faire market society and, you know, people will rise or fall on their own merit. All right, but the main point is this consolidation of national consciousness, you might almost say, in many, many parts of the uh, uh, of, of Northern society. 